Herzlich willkommen beim 36. DocFest München. Herzlich willkommen hier im Silbersaal des Deutschen Theaters. Hier, wo ich sitze, wäre normalerweise, wären normalerweise Kinostühle, würden normalerweise Sie sitzen. Und nebenan im großen Saal würden wir, hätten wir normalerweise am 5. Mai unsere große Eröffnung gefeiert und in den darauffolgenden Tagen ganz großes Kino, ganz große Dokumentarfilme präsentiert. Stattdessen sitze ich hier jetzt alleine auf unserer schönen äh, orangen Couch und freue mich, Sie zu begrüßen zu unseren Filmgesprächen, die wir mit Filmemacherinnen und Filmemacher führen. Mein Name ist Monika Haas, ich bin Teil des Programmteams und mit meiner Kollegin Adele Kuhut habe ich die Doc Guest Kanada Reihe kuratiert, die wir in diesem Jahr zeigen. Unser Gastland Kanada ist unser Gastland deswegen, es ist Teil des Kulturprogramms von Kanada anlässlich des Gastlandauftritts bei der Frankfurter Buchmesse und wir freuen uns sehr, diese Reihe zeigen zu können. Sieben großartige Perlen des kanadischen Dokumentarfilmschaffens, sieben wundervolle Filme, die sehr unterschiedlich sind, unterschiedliche nicht sein können und so die unterschiedliche, diverse Kultur und Gesellschaft Kanadas widerspiegeln. Das Kulturprogramm und auch unser Schwerpunkt Kanada, unser Gastland Kanada, ist entstanden in enger Zusammenarbeit mit Council for the Arts, Canadian Council for the Arts, Telefilm Kanada und der Regierung von Kanada. Und neben der Filmreihe, die wir zeigen, umfasst unser, äh, unsere Partnerschaft auch einen Auftritt von Filmschaffenden bei unserem DocForum Marktplatz. Einer dieser wundervollen sieben Dokumentarfilme, einer dieser Perlen, ist der Film No Visible Trauma der beiden Filmemacher Marc Sirpa Francourt und Robinda Upal. Und ich freue mich jetzt sehr, die beiden hier bei mir auf dem Sofa im Silbersaal begrüßen zu dürfen. A warm welcome to Marc and uh, Robinda. Nice to see you. Nice to have you here. Good that you are here. Thank, Thank you very you much, so much for having us. So your film, No Visible Drama, uh, could, not, could not have been more, um, more time, more in the time like now, given a just concluded trial um, against um, the police officer who killed uh, George Floyd and um, who was um, verdict against uh, as guilty. George Floyd's death has sparkled uh, a worldwide debate uh, about racism, especially within the police. So how much police violence and racism in the police um, was before you started your film or is actually an issue in, Canadian, uh, in the Canadian society? Um, yeah, so it's, you know, it's interesting. Um, you mentioned the timeliness you know we started this film working on it uh now almost six years ago was when we first uh, started doing our research um, at the time uh there was very little attention uh, in canada um, on the subject of, of policing issues police violence um, and obviously that's a very different story now at uh, at, at present uh, that doesn't mean that the issues uh, were not were not there they just weren't being discussed And I think that's the case in a lot of places around the world. Now there's a, a conversation that's happening. Uh, I think Canada, uh, one of the problems we have in this country is that we live in the shadow of the United States of America. And there's a tendency here to want to say, oh, these types of problems, uh, police brutality, racism, these are American problems. They're not Canadian problems. Um, and as we continued our research, it became very clear to us uh, that in fact, these were very much Canadian problems. And uh, we think part of why they're actually uh, so severe is really the lack of attention, this kind of sloughing off of, of interest and responsibility that's mm. been, been going on for some time. Uh, so we're obviously, I think, um, not just as documentarians, but as citizens, um, quite, uh, I think, uh, we, we, we certainly believe it's warranted the kind of attention um, that these issues are now getting in Canada and elsewhere uh, around the world from what we've seen. And you... You, the two of you were both born and raised in Calgary. So when you started the research process, have you been, have you been astonished about how deep the uh, violence goes through the police? Uh, absolutely. I think for us, uh, like many people, we expected that Calgary would have very low rates of police killings and, and other incidents like the ones we've, we see in the film. And uh, it was 
a revelation for us and a, a shock when we started doing the research and putting together the pieces and realizing that actually there was enough here, not only to justify a film, but to set us on this huge journey of, of uncovering these issues. And as Mark had said already, um, people in Canada don't realize that this is a pretty severe issue. And I, you know, something I learned the other day is that among wealthy nations, Canada is actually second after the United mm. States in terms of police killings. And that's not uh, something that should be the case. And we certainly were surprised to, to learn that it was as bad as it was. So how did you pick these three stories in particular, or stories or the, these three families um, and people who uh, have been um, under police violence killed or not killed, but um, yeah, how did you pick them? How did you find your protagonists? No, it's a really good question. Uh, unfortunately, there are so many different yeah. incidents uh, in Calgary. Uh, it really, it, 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 in fact, narrowing the parameters as to which we would focus on was in, in, indeed a challenge. Um, part of it is sort of personal connections and happenstance. Uh, in the, the, the first story we really started looking at was Godfrey's. Uh, mm -hmm. which is really, I think, sort of the main through line yeah. throughout the film. Um, we were introduced to him back in mid-2015 by his then uh, defense attorney, mm -hmm. uh, Joan Bloomer, who we also see in the film, uh, who had just finished the trial. And she was so disturbed, uh, not just by the prosecution that they had been successful, you know, rejecting, but by what had happened to him. And uh, she basically, uh, you know, said... Uh, perhaps this is somebody you want to talk to. And that was really the, you know, the, the first incident we started looking into in detail. Um, and for a long time, we were focused on Godfrey's story. Mm -hmm. uh, jump ahead in real time, very similar to what we see in the film, when a year and a half later in early 2017, there are these charges announced, and initially the officer isn't named. And of course, when this is revealed that it was Constable Trevor Lindsay, the same officer who we see in the video mm -hmm. uh, of Godfrey also assaulting him, I mean, not only were we disturbed by the behavior of this individual, but it really pushed us to start asking bigger questions about the accountability mechanisms. How was it that Godfrey had made this very serious formal complaint about this behavior that it seems to have been totally unaddressed? Uh, this individual went on with impunity um, to behave in a similar way, you know, a year and a half later. Um, so that was sort of, and obviously when we see that, um, you know, the, the intertwining of those stories for us and then the fact that we would have a trial to follow, this seemed to be a natural narr uh, narrative arc to follow. Uh, in terms of the Heffernan shooting, um, again, it, it's, it is tragic that there are so many different choices to choose from. Uh, that was an incident which we thought was very powerful for a number of reasons, um, specifically because of how, um, and this was drama that was, uh, or this was, was happening as we was doing our research, but this whole that, you know, with, the, with ACERT, the uh, accountability body, the watchdog, having mm -hmm. recommended charges and the Crown not pursuing. So to us, this was such a potent example of the system not functioning, of the double standards that we hear about in the film. And obviously the fact that Tom Engel, the lawyer in Edmonton, uh, is also representing this family. We also saw there a natural, um, you know, connective tissue, which is, which is of course, I think, uh, helps us unfurl the story. So those are some of the factors. And the Heffernan family, I just, um, you know, I mean, we spoke to a lot of different people and I think that um, it's not an easy thing to ask a family mm -hmm. like that or victims like this to participate. And uh, they were uh, of those who were really um, obviously affected and really did want to speak out and continue to, um, in a way that, you know, to, to, to have the story of what had happened to their brother and their... Um, you know, and their son uh, be, be told, because they really didn't feel, even though that they had had some media attention, that that, um, that, that had happened. Yeah, that was actually one of my questions. Um, how did you manage to, to bring the people to, to talk to you or to trust you to, to share their really sad stories um, with you and with not only with you, with the audience, with the whole world somehow? So um, they must have been some time or somehow traumatized, I guess, and... Yeah, on the other hand, you can, you can imagine that they would like to talk their stories and would like to share their stories uh, with the people. So this difference um, arises in, uh, in my mind when I, when I see the film because it, yeah, it, it, it's a big anger when you see it. You always had the, had the image to uh, imagine to, 
to, to, to, to scream, to cry, to whatever. Yeah. So did, uh, did they trust you from the very beginning or do you have to be, did you have to be a bit more yeah, patient to, to bring them to talk? I think uh, in every case there was a process of, of gaining that trust and I think people will be familiar with this from other films and other documentarians, but it's a, usually a long process. I think in this case, because uh, certainly in Godfrey's case and in the case of the Heffernans, um, these are people who are very motivated, mm. uh, very motivated to make sure that this kind of thing doesn't happen again. Mm. And so maybe more than in some other cases, we had uh, people who really did want to speak and want to have their story told. In the case of the Howarth family, there was definitely a process because they had been, I think the other aspect of this people have to realize is when these stories come out, of course, now in the world of social media, there's backlash against these families. And people are very dismissive sometimes of the victims of police violence. And that's very painful. And I think that was something that the Howarth family did face. And so they were quite hesitant to, to speak or to get involved. But ultimately, I think for them as well, the, the whole incident had been so uh, traumatizing, had affected their family so much that ultimately they decided that it was worth it to speak with us. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm very glad that they did choose to do that because, um, again, their contribution is is enormous and really helps, uh, I think, illustrate why some of these issues, these accountability issues are so severe and why, you know, in the case of Trevor Lindsay, Constable Trevor Lindsay, why it's so severe that he wasn't reprimanded, he wasn't punished in, in Godfrey's case and that he was back on the street. So it's really important for us to, to build that trust and, and hmm. get all these different stories into the film. I'll just add that, you know, there's, uh, you know, we're talking both the families and then other people that, you know, appear in the film, lawyers, former police chief, uh, you know, former officer Jennifer Magnus and Sheila Ball. Um, I think for us, it was very important to establish uh, credibility, essentially, that uh, what we were not interested in was making a polemic, mm. you know, a film that would um, really just speak to one side. I think that established, you know, that uh, that was very important. I think there was a big desire from all the folks involved to have an honest, uh, detailed, uh, factual engagement with what was going on because it's very easy I think to just you know shout and scream from from any side of, a, of an issue so I think the fact that ours is more of a you know a, a more sort of centered in a kind of journalistic approach I think was um, you know was important as well yeah that that that's the thing that that's one of the thing that makes your film uh, so deep and so so interesting that you have these different perspectives, not only the victims and the families, but also people who are, who are or have been involved in the system and can talk about how the system, how the function of the system is and how deep the violence, racism, the uh, policy of don't talk, don't look at, uh, at things, don't mention things um, is um, actually in the police. So that's really interesting and also Interesting is um, that you're using a lot of different material. You do have footage from TV um, broadcasting, from, um, from the camera, from the helicopter cam. How did you get approach to these, um, these materials? Um, the acquiring the materials was a, a long process. Um, in, in many cases, we're dealing with uh, footage and that's been released through freedom of information when you're talking about the, uh, or, or has come out in trial in court proceedings. So in the case of um, the incident where Daniel Howarth was slammed to the ground, mm -hmm. that was something that came out as a court exhibit. And the same applies for the video of Godfrey being assaulted. Um, that was something that came out as part of uh, court proceedings and is in, in the public domain. We spent a long time pouring over every bit of video that we could find that was related to these issues and, and cataloging it and then uh, doing fair dealing for whenever we could uh, uh, incorporate it into the story. And I know, I mean, our freedom of information request, I'll let Mark speak to that a little bit, but that has been a whole, uh, another chapter of accountability and sort of the structure that we've had to deal with. Yeah, there's, a, there's actually a fair bit of archival material that appears in the film that's never been released anywhere else. For example, um, the photographs that we see of the hotel room that were taken by the crime scene unit after the shooting of Anthony mm -hmm. Heffernan, um, you know, those are 
uh, images that we were able to get through the police service. In order to do so, we had to do a legal process in which we were able to act with the legal authorization of the parents, which was also predicated upon them having been given uh, sort of a, a, a kind of permission by a judge beforehand to act on their son's behalf, which is not automatic, uh, surprisingly. Um, so there's a number of things, and, and actually there's a whole sort of uh, uh, world of side issues in related to these materials. Like, for example, with those images, we currently have a number of appeals that we are, there's a long, and this is going to drag on for years, where we are appealing the decisions made by these different bodies, the police, by the province, mm. in terms of revealing, uh, releasing the materials. Long and the short of it is <clears throat> we find quite disturbing the kind of, you know, I'll just take a step back. We always imagine like, oh, well, these are government agencies. They must have very clear rules, right, about this is what we release and when and how and all that. And the reality is that there actually seems to be a tremendous amount of discretion that's applied. So we've taken very serious and we're very concerned by some of the decisions. For example, with those uh, images from the, from the crime scene, they made the decision to redact entirely any part of Anthony's body. Now, obviously, these are going to be very disturbing images, um, but the notion that they feel that they have the right to, and it's not just denying us, it's effectively denying the parents, saying that we don't think that you should have the right to see what we did to your child, uh, we find uh, very disturbing, and we'll have to see how that plays out over time, but potentially not based in any sort of legal reality. And this is just one example of many ways in which we've seen that uh, there's just, it seems to us there's, there's actually not a lot of investigative work going on. There's not a lot of engagement with these different issues or with these different institutions. So uh, this is sort of stimulated for us like a broader interest um, sort of above what we see in the film and the functioning of these institutions. And I think this would, I imagine that uh, German audiences, for example, would also connect with this, where we, we're living in countries where we want to believe, oh, our government institutions, they must have such sort of clear principles and rules and processes in how they do these things. And at every turn, we've actually been uh, often quite disturbed uh, by how poorly or haphazardly that those institutions seem to be functioning. Yeah, and that, that's another point that makes your film so, so deep, that you, you had these to talk a bit more about um, how you make the film and, and, and the structure of the film that makes the film so deep that you somehow have the impression of watching a thriller or uh, whatever because your narration is so, um, is so intelligent and so, so well composed. You're talking, so actually you're talking about things who are in the past. You're talking about uh, situations and crimes who are in the past, but you manage to to put it in the in the nowadays and um, to put your narration through these um, different materials and footage to one big story, and that's really yeah really a big and a good job uh, that you did. So my compliments to that. Uh, another you, question that I um, that I have is. Um, The title of your film, um, you call it No, Visi no Visible Tra Trauma. So, yeah, the trauma itself is not visible, um, but, yeah, it's, it's deep. It's deep in, in the people, in the families, in the victims. But is it also a trauma that's within the police, that stays within the police, that they recognize uh, that they have to change something, that they have to do something, and that's not enough to... Uh, to say, our police is the best police, there's no problem at all, we manage everything. So how deep is, is the trauma in the police? I think that's a, that's a very interesting question. And it, it, uh, it goes back to what you were saying about how we have the chief, the former police chief and the current chief, but also Jennifer Magnus, this former constable who was very traumatized by her uh, experiences at the Calgary police. And I think part of the reason those folks wanted to talk to us is because this type of culture, this type of also the, the impact on society, the behavior, the violent behavior, it has a very negative impact on the police officers. It, it makes their job harder, but also it, it, it erodes that trust that police needs to have with the communities that they serve in order for them to be effective. And 
that erosion is part of the, the trauma, I think, that, that is writ large in this, uh, in this film, that the public, and then you see that towards the end of the film in, in, when Gothard is speaking in front of that huge crowd, people are realizing that, uh, in fact, the, the police have been getting away with things and not operating in a way that is honest, not operating in a way that uh, fits with the rest of society. And I think that's, uh, that's a huge issue. Mm. And maybe my, my last question, because we have to come uh, to an end. What's a, uh, that's a pity, but it, it is as it is. Um, you premiered your film at the Vancouver Film Festival, and um, since then it has, to be, it has been broadcasted uh, throughout uh, Canada, I guess, or have been also screened and, and, and shown at um, different festivals. How was the reaction from not only the audience, but uh, from the society itself, from the media, from the officials, from, from the Calgary police officers, whatever. Did you, uh, did you get some reactions and how, um, how have they been? Oh yeah, I mean, there's, you know, it's interesting actually, and we were quite, uh, I would say, fortunate as filmmakers in the sense that um, there were, we also produced for CBC, which is, uh, you know, our national broadcaster in Canada, a shortened version for television that also screened quite widely. Uh, so in conjunction, you know, between the, the feature film and the TV version, we've actually, I think, reached quite a large audience. I mean, the response is, uh, you know, it's not, it's, uh, I think there's a lot of appreciation that's been communicated to us by many different sectors of society, including personal notes that we've gotten from police officers within the Calgary Police Service thanking us for doing the work that we're doing from defense attorneys, et cetera, saying that, you know, this is uh, finally, you know, they're seeing some, uh, some light on these issues that they've been so affected by. Um, there's certainly a lot of uh, the more reactionary types. You know, we, you'll see people making comments, you know, through social media where clearly they, it, it, they haven't seen the film or if they have, it's, they're so entrenched in their views that they're, um, you know, they're not interested in engaging with the issues. Um, that being said, you know, like, in the context of Calgary, which is of course where this is set and where we're from and it's such an important, you know, we, uh, a number of things have happened. Uh, you know, the film was used in city, in city council by different council members and in different sorts of uh, now groups that are organizing around these issues as a sort of uh, organizing point, a, a discussion point. And I think part of it is to have specific narratives, tangible narratives that people can point to, the Godfrey story, the Heffernan story. These are very important to actually be able to have a bigger discussion. Um, in terms of the reaction from the police department as a whole, uh, they, we are not aware of any criticism from the police department of any of the factual content of the film, which for us uh, feels like um, an accomplishment in the sense that uh, I'm sure that um, uh, it would have been nice for them to be able to poke holes in our, in our story. Um, you know, that being said, we are being sued by an officer who appears, appears very briefly uh, in the film for something like 20 seconds who isn't even named. Mm -hmm. uh, and as far as we're, we, I mean, it seems, until, we, until we're told otherwise, or it's confirmed otherwise, we're under the impression that that suit, which is going to be very, very expensive, uh, potentially, ultimately, is being paid for by the police union. Um, so we do sort of see that as, um, as a kind of a reaction from that more reactionary sort of right-wing traditionalist uh, population. So there is a lot of push and shove. I'll just say very quickly, for example, I had a conversation with... Um, uh, the, the father of a close friend, we all grew up in Calgary yesterday, uh, he's a child psychologist in Calgary, you know, and he talks about, uh, you know, he's lived there for many decades, that this film haunts him, you know, that he, he continues to live in the city, his whole interaction uh, with police officers, he actually serves on a board uh, of, a, of an organization that deals with domestic violence, and he talks about how he's had such a hard time uh, interacting with the police that are involved in this organization, that he's just been brought to tears many times, uh, you know, by what uh, he's seen in this film. So I think that um, there has been a big reaction both locally um, and, you know, when we filmed in Calgary, we actually won the audience award at the film festival there uh, and then across the country. Uh, I just think that generally of people being very disturbed what they see and there are people who, if they're aware of these issues, they're appreciative that, you know, finally there's discussion, but a lot of people, like the, the guy, the older gentleman I talked about, who mm -hmm. just had no idea that this was going on, and they'll never look at their, uh, the police department in their, uh, in their community the same way. And how did the two of you work together doing this film? 
What what uh, was the what was your part? What was your part? Did you everything we, discussed, or do you have different roles? We we have slightly different roles, but we're very very collaborative, and I think we're fortunate. We've been friends for many many years, and have developed a very uh, close working relationship. And uh, everything is driven by consensus between us. And uh, you know, I tend to do more of the cinematography, and, and Mark has, took the the very onerous job of. Uh, being the interviewer in our uh, during our shoots, but the editing process, the editorial process, was uh, very collaborative, and I, I I don't know of another pair of people who work quite the same way, but uh, we've we've managed to uh, subject everything to the scrutiny of two sets of eyes. I think, which is something we're we're quite happy with. So you, the two of you are also co-founders of Lost Time Media, a production company. And um, my really last question now is uh, about your next projects, uh, which, you, which you would like to, to do together, I guess. Do you have st uh, already plans for next uh, documentary? Yeah, we're actually, um, we're producing a feature film. This is our first, I mean, we've produced the work of other folks before, uh, you know, in the past uh, short films, but this is the first feature film. It's set in Vancouver. Uh, it's called Love in the Time of Fentanyl. And it's a sort of a community portrait of a renegade uh, safe injection site um, uh, that is how they're sort of responding um, to the opioid crisis, uh, which in Vancouver is, uh, is particularly in Canada, but in Vancouver is particularly uh, severe. It's some of the, the highest rates of overdose death uh, in the world. Um, and that's a film that we're uh, producing with ITVS in the States and with mm -hmm. the support of the Sundance Institute. Um, so uh, the director and editor is uh, Colin Askey and our co-producer is Monica Navarro, who's with Firelight Media out of New York. So that film um, is in uh, sort of an advanced edit uh, late in post-production. So uh, you never know, maybe uh, next year we can yeah, be back. At the that's next uh, a good cliffhanger uh, for our audience. Maybe we can um, say hello in person then next year. Oh, that would I would wish you such a I really pleasure. hope so. So thanks a lot, Mark. Thanks a lot, Robinda. Thanks for being here with us, even uh, only on this way. But um, yeah, we heard that you are, uh, you heard that you are invited for next year already. And um, I hope you will come. So, um, falls und ich hoffe, wenn und das ähm, Ihnen ähm, No Visible Trauma gefallen hat, äh, Sie können gerne für diesen Film für den Kino Kino Publikumspreis abstimmen. Er ist wie alle anderen Filme im Programm nominiert. Kino Kino Publikumspreis, wie jedes Jahr, wird präsentiert bzw. gestiftet von den Redaktionen von BR und Reisat. Vielen Dank und viel Spaß beim DocFest. Thank you.